stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. Rescue 911. Sponsored by Mountain Grown Folgers Coffee. Folgers, the best part of waking up. Curiosity has always driven man to explore, despite the fact that there might be risks involved. On October 28, 1990, in a remote area of Alabama, five young men set out for an afternoon adventure with no idea that it might lead to tragedy. Cave rescue differs from many types of rescue in the sense that it's not an easy load and go situation. You can't simply back the ambulance up and load your patient in. Not too long ago, we did a cave rescue, and it ultimately took 54 of us 18 hours to get this injured person out of the cave. Tom Harris and his friend Paul Ahi had traveled from Florida to spend a weekend with local caving enthusiasts. Among them was Pat Lancaster. Since Tom and Paul were visiting with us from Tallahassee, we wanted to do a vertical caving trip that went to a pit that they'd not done before. So we decided that we would take Paul and Tom up to Moses' tomb. Paul had only been caving for two years. What we were planning to do is what's called bouncing the pit, and that's where you just rappel down to the bottom and then just climb back up. What do you think? A little cave in today? Pat and Art Goller had rappelled the more than 200 feet down to the bottom of Moses' tomb before. Moses' tomb has the biggest flowstone formation I've ever seen in it. It's about 150 feet tall. It's gorgeous. It has all kinds of formations on the climb up. You ready to go in, dude? No, go ahead. Tom was going to go down first, but he had a little bit of trouble with his light. So Howard went down first. It was only the third time Howard Cobb had rappelled down into any cave. Unless you've got a car headlight on your on your helmet, you can't see the bottom. So the whole time you're just you're cruising. I was doing doing pretty good speed down the road. After Howard was off rope, Tom went ahead and then began to rig onto the rope. On rope! And then I heard Tom holler on rope. someone screaming up 
from the bottom of the pit. Yes! After a few moments, we ascertained that it was Howard and that he was calling for help. At that time, those of us on top didn't really have a clear idea of what had completely happened, but we knew that there was serious trouble. He fell about 100 feet! Do I need to come down? Art was the person who already had his harness on and was ready to descend next. Hang on, he's on top of the rope! Howard! We're going for help. Okay. Talk to me, Tom. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. He was cold and he was gasping. He was sputtering. Like he was going into some type of seizure. Talk to me, buddy. Talk to me, buddy. All right, our rope's free. Come on. On rope. You're just trying to, for your heart not to bust out of your chest, you know, that this is real and it's happening. And oh, my God. By the time Art got to the bottom of the cave, Tom had begun to regain consciousness. Man, I, don't know, I don't know what happened. He got over the lip and he just started cruising. It's very obvious that his left leg was fractured badly just because of the way it was bent back. And I tore the bottom of my shirt off to stop the bleeding there. The nearest telephone was at a truck stop 15 minutes away. YW899, clear. At 11.40 a.m., the call for help came into the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department. Yeah, hello. Uh, my friend's been in an accident. The local rescue squad from Ider was immediately dispatched to the scene. Volunteer member Ricky Little also responded from his home. I immediately went back to dispatch and notified them that I was en route for them to notify Rainsville Rescue Squad because they had more appropriate repelling type gear that we would need involved with cave rescue. It's getting cold. Yeah. It didn't look good. He's really complaining of pain and can't feel his legs, and you're worried. I wasn't sure whether or not he was going to make it or not. He was in pretty, pretty rough shape. The first EMTs arrived at the scene within 50 minutes. Without the repelling gear needed to get them 230 feet down into the cave and Tom back up, they were helpless. I advised base, base contacted Rainsville, they're in route with repellers. Minutes later, the Rainsville Rescue Squad arrived with some ropes and repelling equipment. Okay, we're gonna set up a LZ here in case we need to do a scene flight. We were by no means experts in rope rescue field, and of course we didn't have any idea of how extensive the man was injured. It had been more than two hours since the accident. Tom's condition was continuing to deteriorate. At the top of the cave, paramedic Anthony Clifton assessed the scene. You, got a man the about 120 feet. you have no immediate access to a victim, particularly in a vertical cave, and realized almost immediately that it was, in fact, more than we could handle because uh, of the depth of the cave. Anthony, being experienced in repelling, volunteered to descend and provide the necessary emergency response for the victim. Pretty much everything we're going to need, I think. The Chattanooga Hamilton County Cave Rescue Team was called in, but they were based 50 miles away in Tennessee. The rope's free! You're ready, Anthony. As soon as they get here... And I knew that there was a person down there who needed help, and I knew that I had enough experience to get to that patient. But we had a close friend who had died attempting a sim similar rescue uh, some weeks earlier. Anthony then handed me his personal contents and said, tell Barbara, that's his wife, I love her, and I... Then he descended to the bottom of the tomb. On rope!
when we continue. I was down there by myself and had a person who could very likely die on me, and that was a scary feeling. Tom Harris was rappelling into a cave more than 200 feet deep when he lost control and fell to the rock floor below. He was in critical condition and urgently needed emergency medical care. But the rescuers didn't have the specialized equipment for the difficult task of getting him out safely. While rescue workers waited outside the narrow opening at the top of the cave, paramedic Anthony Clifton attempted the dangerous descent to reach Tom. My name is Anthony. I'm a paramedic. He was not talking. He had the general appearance of being in shock. There was a considerable amount of blood on the rocks. He was pale, cool, sweaty, had a, a rapid pulse. We noticed that the leg that was fractured, he was not complaining of pain there, which caused us to believe that his back was seriously injured. Come on in here. We got to get all this gear put in here. This, this black bag, that blue bag. Jerry Smith, an expert in rope rescue, happened to be teaching a class not far from the cave. When the group heard about the situation, they offered their equipment and assistance. The main line is going to be over here. The lay line will be over here. Tom, take a deep breath in. Most of the time when you do a rescue, you have access. You can simply holler at somebody and say, hand me this or hand me that. But in this respect, I was down there myself, had a person who could very likely die on me, and that was a scary feeling. Directional, ready to go. Jerry's class rigged the mechanical advantage system needed to haul up the stretcher in less than 30 minutes. We had that rigged up very fast. The guys had just taken the class, and we had just done it less than an hour earlier, so they knew exactly what needed to be put together. They put the anchors in, they put the hardware on, and that thing was ready to go very quickly. Hey, man. Yeah, watch out for me coming. All right, I'm not the patient. All right. When okay. Paul came down, he brought me another radio, and we relayed the information from us about the patient's condition to the top of the cave, and it was relayed on to the hospital. Down rope on the belay line. I think you got more of the slack than the main line. I got plenty of slack. OK. Where's it hurt on your back? Where my hand is? Ah, yes. Hold still. Real easy. That's an easy moment. We over, put him onto a long backboard to stabilize his spine. Easy, guys. Keep his neck straight. We started an IV and completed a, another assessment. Go ahead and get that over here. Three hours after the accident, the cave rescue team, including EMT Dennis Curry, arrived to help lift Tom out of Moses' tomb. He's been coordinating everything. Okay, I'm gonna need EMT Curry had rappelled into this cave before. Rope! Blood pressure at this time is... The caves in many areas of the United States tend to be very cold. This cold that they're constantly in is simply going to aggravate the situation. It's a race, truly a race against time. One, two, three, up. Okay. At that time, we began to package him into the basket for the lift. The captain of the cave team, Buddy Lane, decided that he wanted me to go ahead and rappel down to the bottom of Moses' tomb where the patient was to assist in packaging and then later the hoist of the victim towards the entrance. Oh, it's tight. I'll be right down with you guys here in a second to help you the best I can. 10 4. Update on patient just as soon as we can get it. Okay. How can I help you? He was very lucid when I got to him, and we were able to converse with him clearly. He indicated that he was experiencing some numbness from approximately the waist down, so we were very concerned that he may have uh, injured his spine. We've got several heat packs here. I'm going to activate these. More Try to be careful with putting them right against the skin. It would take nearly an hour to raise Tom to the surface. Tom, you look pretty cold, so this is going to help you a lot. We had to make sure that his condition was stabilized to the point that he would be OK from the time he left bottom to the time he reached medical assistance on top. I want you to go ahead and have him come up to me. OK, Tom, you're going to feel a little movement now until it doesn't hurt you. Nice and easy. Okay. And as the litter began to be raised, I climbed single rope technique on a separate rope right next to him. OK, Tom, we're on our way out. Because of the seriousness of Tom's injuries, the basket had to be raised very carefully 
an inch at a time, keeping it as level as possible. Buddy is coming in. Buddy Lane climbed in to assist in getting the stretcher out at the top. Okay, he's fixing to descend down to the first wedge. Getting a little spin, buddy. We should be able to get it out near the top. Dennis was real concerned about the speed of the stretcher coming up. He wanted to make sure that the stretcher was moving at a nice, smooth, even pace. With the mechanical advantage system that we use, we're able to do that real easy. We could move him fractions of an inch at a time. OK, now we need to swing underneath our other rope right here, OK? Hang on. OK, Tom. Well, I've almost got you out of here, guy. OK, can you hold on to him right to the hall? Stop. Stop. Okay. Really in All right, let us know what you need. I'm going to put the in. Okay, we're just to level off here, son. When we got to the entrance, uh, the pit, about two by two feet, I had to get underneath the litter, and it was everything that we could do with us working inside and the men on the team outside the hole okay. pulling and us trying to slowly manipulate the litter through that very tight opening. Okay, haul, haul, slow. Okay, now you're going to have to start pulling on that headline. Okay, okay. slow, angle. stop, stop. I mean, if he didn't fit, he had to go back to the bottom. The and then everybody on the bottom had to be cleared out of the way, and we had to take whatever measures were necessary to enlarge that entrance. Stop. Watch this rope here. Okay. Okay. Watch this head. Watch this. Just enough, guys. Edge roll is clear. Coming up. They were able to go ahead and lift the litter vertically through the hole. If Mr. Harris had been about one inch bigger man through the chest, we probably would have had to cut rock to get him out this entrance. Y'all go ahead and carry him on over. Pretty soon we saw his good old fuzzy bearded face and his helmet and all coming out. It made the hole a lot better at that point. It was pretty hard up till then. Slow it down, slow it down. And while we were carrying Tom down, he looked up at me at one point and I said, how you doing? He gave me a thumbs up. All the way down the mountain, all right? Six and a half hours after his fall, Tom Harris arrived at Erlanger Medical Center, where x-rays revealed that a crushed vertebrae in his spine was partially paralyzing him from the waist down. As I was lying there on the bottom waiting for the rescue, I remember after I felt that I, I knew that my legs weren't working, didn't have any feeling in them, I remember thinking to myself that I was going to survive. I made that decision that I was going to survive this, and it wasn't too big a uh, problem to manage. Gotcha. Tom was hospitalized for two and a half weeks. Doctors are unsure if he'll ever walk again. But as soon as he returned home, he began physical therapy sessions to try and regain the use of his legs. His wife, Ursula, and his friends have been very supportive. People he never even knew before were just calling him up and you know, asking him, how's it going? How are you feeling? What can I do for you? It was, it was amazing how close everyone was. For someone who had, you know, just gone through what he had gone through, he was in quite good spirits, to say the least, and had a very good outlook for possibilities of recovery in the future. The people involved with the rescue were just excellent. They got me out alive. They got me out quickly. I'm not happy about having a spinal cord injury and not being able to walk, but I feel real fortunate that my injuries were not more serious. On December 2nd, 1990, six weeks after the accident, Tom took his first steps. I can't say enough about how much support and care I've gotten from my wife. Through all this, she's been really my best asset of all. And I know a lot of people that have to go through this kind of experience without someone there. She's been wonderful. What I have learned is to, to look at this as an opportunity to grow, and it's certainly been a challenge. The thing that strikes me most is just his zest for life. 
challenging himself and testing limits and seems to, to just to thrive on those challenges. That same uh, enjoyment and challenge is also what's pulling him through um, the accident. In the four and a half months that have passed, Tom has learned to walk with the aid of crutches and to cope with the uncertainty of when, if ever, he will be free of his disability. It's frustrating. Things are getting easier, though. The hardest part of it is just being patient and not knowing how much recovery I'll have. I don't see it going in. <laughs> People interact with you differently when you're in a wheelchair. I didn't realize some of my own prejudices against wheelchair-bound people until I was in one. Um, it's, it's that part of it's kind of hard to deal with. It's real important to remember that a person in a wheelchair is a person. There's no need to, for people to pity my situation because I'm doing real well. I feel like nothing important has changed. I still have the same goals and the same interests. I'm still the same person.